Please be seated now. This morning's celebration, the Feast of Christ the King, is the last Sunday of the church's year. The church's year will begin, again, will begin anew next Sunday, the first Sunday of Advent. Now, I don't know about you, but on the surface, this seems like a pretty strange way to finish out a year at church. I mean, usually people mark the passing of another year by throwing a party or making a New Year's resolution. But in church, we do things a little bit differently by proclaiming Jesus as our king. The idea of taking a Sunday of the church's year to celebrate Christ as king is actually a relatively new addition to the church's calendar. The feast of Christ the king was first proclaimed just 99 years ago in 1925 by Pope Pius XI in response to the rise of ultranationalism totalitarianism, and secularism in Europe. As these ideologies lured more and more adherents, Pope Pius wanted Catholics and all Christians to remember that it was God who was the ultimate source of power and authority in the world. And it was Jesus Christ who ultimately reigned as their king. It was to him that Christians owed their trust and their loyalty before any ruler or state or ideology. Today's feast was also intended to remind Christians during a time of great upheaval and instability that Jesus didn't look like other rulers and he didn't rule like other rulers either. And so today, in our own time and context, 2024, in the United States of America, we too are reminded of these things, that it is still God who is the ultimate source of all power and authority, that it is still Jesus who is our King, and that it is to him that we owe our trust and our loyalty before anyone else. Of course, as people who live in America, we might also be just a little uneasy with the whole idea of having a monarch, at least one who isn't on Netflix. As Americans, we have come to place our trust instead in a democratic system of checks and balances, at least on paper. We have historically been suspicious of people who are born into power and have too much power concentrated in the hands of a single person. The founders of this country went to great lengths to ensure that the business of governing would be shared by many rather than just a few. Although, even from our beginning, more than half the population of the country was not allowed to participate fully. And yet, for all of our professed suspicion about kingship and power in the hands of just a few, we Americans certainly do know a thing or two about power. And it is power that I think is really at the heart of this morning's celebration of Christ the King. As Americans, we live in the most powerful nation in the history of the world. We have the most powerful military in the world. Our economy is still the most powerful economy. We are the world leader in technology science and innovation. We have the most Olympic medalists. We are home to more millionaires and billionaires than any other country. And we are second only to China as the biggest carbon emitter in the world. Each year, as a nation, we spend billions of dollars holding on to our power, protecting it, making sure that it doesn't fall into the wrong hands. Holding on to power is an expensive and exhausting task. Yet in spite of the overwhelming power held by our country as a whole, not everyone has an equal share in this power. Some in our country enjoy a lot more power than others by virtue of their upbringing or their skin color or their citizenship status 
or their gender or gender identity or education. This includes us too, right here at St. Thomas Episcopal Church. Not all of us share the same amount of power. Some in our community enjoy a great deal of power. On the other hand, others in our community live on the edges, barely able to make ends meet every week. The distribution of power in this world is and always has been unequal. And that is a reality that should make us uncomfortable. It should make us long for a world that is different. And this, I think, is where Jesus comes back into the picture. Because you see, the people of Jesus' day longed for a world that was different too. Many of the people who ended up following Jesus were themselves disempowered or dissatisfied by the status quo. For nearly a hundred years, they had been living under Roman occupation, and Roman rule could be oppressive and cruel. Daily life for most people living in first century Palestine was filled with uncertainty, fear, and desperation. In the midst of these circumstances, the people were eagerly awaiting a Messiah, a king who would come and liberate them. Messiah literally means anointed one, one who is anointed as kings and queens are anointed. Now, most Jews were expecting a Messiah who would come and reign over them like an earthly king or the emperor. They were expecting a powerful political figure who would deliver them from the hands of the Romans, a strong man who would come with might and make everything great again. Jesus, a Galilean Jew born into poverty, who told people that they should turn the other cheek and love their enemies, didn't exactly fit the bill. In fact, nothing about Jesus suggested royalty or Messiah material, certainly not according to the world's expectations. In our gospel story for this morning from John's gospel, which is also the gospel story for Good Friday, Pilate himself is baffled by how this man who stands before him accused of sedition and blasphemy could be a king. Are you the king of the Jews? He asked Jesus incredulously. Jesus is certainly not like any king he's ever known. And if we're honest, he's probably not like many leaders we've known either. Certainly not many of those vying for power in this past election cycle. Today, on the feast of Christ the King, we remember something about Jesus that he comes and brings something different, a different way of being king, a different way of being in power. This is what Jesus is talking about when he replies to Pilate in the gospel and says, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom belonged to this world, Jesus says, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over but as it is, my kingdom is not from here. You see, Jesus knew where his power came from. He knew that it didn't come from anyone else. He knew that unlike in the world, the way he held power was not a zero-sum game, a game in which he kept all of the power for himself while everyone else got none. He knew that his power was not ultimately for himself and his own benefit and protection. And so, when he came as king, his reign looked very different. He reigned not by grasping for power or holding on to power at all costs, but rather by giving his power away, by sharing it with others, and especially those who had no power. He reigned not by wielding power over others or dominating others, but instead by serving. I am among you as one who serves, he once told his friends. And if you want to follow me, then you must know this, to be truly great, 
you must be willing to serve others. He reigned not by enlarging himself, but by humbling himself. For in the kingdom of God, he often said, it is only those who humble themselves who will be exalted. He reigned not with an iron fist, but instead by becoming vulnerable and by living his life with and for others who were vulnerable, those who were most vulnerable, those who were poorest, those at the bottom, those the world had scorned. No one knew this about Jesus better than St. Paul, who tried to describe what it looked like for Jesus to be king in his letter to the Philippian Christians, and also to encourage them to follow in his footsteps. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, Paul told them, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, humbling himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is our king. This is our king. This one who willingly emptied himself and became as a slave. He is the one who ultimately claims our trust, who claims our loyalty, who claims our hearts before anyone else. And if we are serious about following him, then we too are called, no, commanded, to follow his example, to empty ourselves, to let his mind be our mind and his life the pattern for our lives. The Trappist monk, Thomas Keating, once said that whenever we do this, we are already reigning with Christ in his kingdom. Whenever we do this, we are already reigning with Christ in his kingdom. Not just one day down the road when we die and go to heaven, but today, the minute that we accept Jesus' call to live our lives as he did. Now before I close, there is some fine print that you should know about in a life of following Jesus. If we follow him as our king, we might not be great or successful, at least not as the world defines greatness and success. And there is no guarantee of upward mobility if we follow him either. In fact, as the Jesuit priest Dean Brackley once put it, accepting a call to follow Jesus as our king is accepting a call to live a life of downward mobility, a call to get our hands and hearts dirty, bringing the reign of God to people, a call to live our lives with and for the people Jesus did, a call to love the people that he loved without limit and without exception, a call to give whatever power we may have away, trusting that when we do, the reign of Christ will come near and we will inherit his kingdom. Amen.